his book, Hanok and the History of the Korean House, co-authored co -authored with Professor Bong Hee Jeon, was awarded Excellent Scholarly Book of Year 2013 by the Ministry of the Culture, Sports, and Tourism in Korea. Previously, he worked as a researcher at Seoul National University uh, and lecturer at uh, Aju University and visiting fellow at Harvard University. Currently, he is working as an architectural designer at Elkos Manfredi Architects in Boston. In 2010, Dr. Kwon played a crucial role in uh, design, uh, designating the two traditional Korean villages, uh, Hawe Village and Yangdong Village as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Today, Dr. Kwon will talk about how valuable our traditional Hanok is as a wonderful environment for our daily living. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Yong Chan Kwon. Uh, hi, um, I'm Yong Chan. Um, nice to meet you all today. And I'm going to share my screen to start uh, the presentation. Uh, do you all see the slideshow here? Uh, okay. Um, so this slideshow is an excerpt of the uh, presentation in 2009 to e-commerce, ICOMS, by Professor Bong Yi Jun of Seoul National University. Uh, the e-commerce, the organization does um, investigates and decides whether a candidate heritage can be a world heritage or not. And I was at the time one of the colleagues being a uh, PhD candidate and worked on submitting the reports of Hawe and Yangdong village. And both of them now designated as world heritage by UNESCO in 2010. The contents goes as follows. And plus I've added some videos as visual aids. So Hawe village is located in Gyeongsangbukdo uh, due to the mountain range, uh, which is depicted as a red line here. Uh, this area had formed a somewhat different cultural area than the uh, central part of Korean peninsula. And Hawe village is located on an alluvion uh, where Nakdonggang river winds around. This shows a very typical way of how a habitat is located in Korea. A mountain in the back, river in the front. And this is called uh, Pesan Imsu. And Byeongsan Sawan Confucian Academy is located on the other side of Mount Hwasan. This is the uh, summary of um, this uh, slideshow. I wanted to show <laughs> up front, but this is this what is saying is um, Hawe village is a total package of um, human habitat. And we will go um, each, each by each uh, from now. Uh, firstly, uh, we will go briefly go over the history and historic figures. So there were actually three clans moved to Hawe village at the end of Goryeo dynasty. And among those uh, three clans, uh, the last one, Byu clan, became the most prosperous and dominant clan in this area. The Ryu clan produced very many um, notable politicians and scholars. And I would say the most uh, famous was the uh, Byu Songryong, who was a prime minister when uh, Japan invaded Joseon dynasty in the 16th century. The village has uh, expanded over more than four centuries. And worshiping on their historic ancestors became, becomes uh, uh, very uh, important and formed the village itself and had an impact on managing the village as well. 
So there are two major uh, figures, Liu Ulyong and Liu Songnyong. And I would say Liu Songnyong was the most uh, famous and uh, important uh, historic figure. And Liu Songnyong was uh, from on their 13th uh, generation of the Liu clan. And from that generation, uh, Liu clan uh, started to prosper in the full scale and the population grew exponentially. Um, about the topography and Peng Su, uh, as I have uh, depicted previously, the Dakdonggang River uh, and on this uh, area, Nakdonggang River, uh, specifically called as Hwachan Stream, Hwachan River. And yes, that river winds down the Haohe village. And under the Mount Hwasan, there's a little farmland. And over the Mount Hwasan, there's a Pungsan field, uh, which is a main source of um, income of this village. And along the Nakdong River, there's a Mansongjong, which is a pine forest, um, pine tree forest, which works as a windbreaker. And across the cliff, there's a Buyongde cliff. And according to the principle of Pungsu, a Haohe village is located like a lotus flower in a pond surrounded by water like an island. Uh, if we take a section of uh, east, west, and northwest of the topography, uh, we can see that the village area is relatively flat. And in the meantime, Chunghyodang and Yangjindang, uh, those two major residential buildings of Hawe village is located uh, on a little of a mount uh, here. Uh, And, and there's a Mansongjong, a pine tree forest, works as a windbreaker. And what is uh, somewhat characteristic about the uh, how buildings are located or laid out is that major buildings are not uh, aligned in one direction, which is actually quite uh, stressed. Uh, in uh, Confucian theory when building uh, traditional architecture in Joseon dynasty. Rather, they are located to have high mound in the back and lower ground in the front to have better views. And you, we can see that uh, kind of uh, characteristics on this aerial uh, view. An overall layout of the village can be categorized into three, uh, farming and residential and spiritual area. And if you uh, access through this uh, route from the north, the entrance uh, of the village actually divides the residential and farming area. And spiritual area is located across the Lakdonggang River and Pyeongsan Sewan area. So this is the uh, aerial view of farming area. And this is um, Buyongde cliff area. And from the right to the left, uh, that is uh, Hwachan Sewan Confucian Academy and Ogyan Jongsa, where uh, Yu Song Leung wrote Jing Birok. And the left is uh, Gyeomam Jongsa. Uh, we'll, uh, talk about later what Sawan is and what Jongsa is and what Jongja and what Sadang is. And this is also the spiritual area uh, of um, Byeongsan Sawan Confucian Academy. And the residential area itself can be also divided into two parts uh, by the road uh, in the middle and the southern part of the village, Namchon, and also northern part of the village, Bukchon. And let's get into more uh, about architecture. 
So this is a plan of the Haohe village. And you can see that um, residential houses, alleys, yards, trees and gardens are, are harmoniously laid out. And here, um, the number 113, this building is Yangjindang, the headquarter of Liu clan, uh, which built about 300 years ago on 16th uh, century. And the one in the uh, below, uh, 046, number 046, this building is Chunghyodang. And these two buildings are the major building of this uh, Hawe village. And this Chunghyodang was built by Yu Song Leung. Uh, so we will get into those uh, two buildings more detail later. Um, so the characteristic of uh, buildings in Haohe village is that they are the oldest residential buildings remaining in Korea. Um, like I said, Yang Jin Dang house is the uh, house of the head family of Haohe village uh, built in 16th century. Uh, other buildings actually built a little later but spanning through a few hundred years. And it, the village also has uh, most outstanding examples of uh, Korea's traditional architecture. So those two buildings, Yangjin Dang House and Chungyo Dang House are the treasures. And Byeongsan Seon Confucian Academy is the historic monument. And there are other nine items of important folklore material. So what is so good and nice about those buildings. Um, these buildings show a technological advances in wooden structures uh, in terms of um, structural frame and interior slash exterior design. These buildings, especially Yang Jin Dang House and Chung Dang House shows the top notch uh, of its development at the time, 16th century. Um, and for those who might uh, encounter Hanok for the first time today, um, I brought a simple video to show how a Hanok is built. So it starts from foundation, uh, podium and foundation, and the column is erected. Uh, and there are pre-carved parts to make joint and prolines um, connect the columns and beams uh, come along comes along the prolines again and the upper part of um, structure is stacked with the pre-carved joint This is where topping off is happening. Uh, in US, in the construction site, people celebrate when the top part of the building element is uh, located. They celebrate with the ceremony. And in Korea, we do the same. And when the, this topping off uh, material is uh, located, we do a uh, ceremony called uh, Sangnyangshik. An angled rafter and normal rafters. The corner rafters and the plates to make planes to sustain sins above. We put roof tiles then. And then interior part, uh, for example, wooden, elevated wooden floor, which is called maru and or 
heated floor system, which is ondol, is um, installed with interior uh, partitions. This is almost the same scale of Jongsa. We will talk about it later. This is very typical uh, plan layout of Jongsa, where uh, Confucian scholars cultivate themselves and study. So that was the uh, construction process of Hanok. And if we look at more closely to the plan layout of these buildings, uh, what we can see is the uh, Confucian rituals and etiquette. So those uh, Confucian uh, theory, how it interpreted by Joseon dynasty scholars, uh, they mostly refer to um, doctrine of uh, Song Dynasty in China, and that is how they interpret it is a very heavy subject to cover. But what I can tell really uh, make the story really shortly, uh, the separation of inner and outer quarters, which actually means uh, the separation of men's and women's place is one of the uh, characteristic. And uh, from their interpretation, buildings should face south. Uh, and that those are one of those uh, big uh, rules uh, that Joseon scholars kind of interpreted from Confucianism in China. And what we can see here is um, on the left, you see you're seeing the Chungyo Dang House plan. And when you go into the house through the main gate, what you firstly meet is a outer quarter, men's area, and the male uh, ownership will uh, greet you here. And if you ever get allowed, you're allowed to enter into the inner quarter, a woman's place here. And if you look at this, um, this is shrine uh, where you worship your uh, famous and most uh, uh, important ancestors. And we'll talk about this later, but uh, the client, the ownership, Yu Song Yong, was more of a practical person, we assume, we can assume, because uh, the residential parts are not actually facing south, uh, but the shrine where the ancestors are worshipped, it strictly faces the south. And here, Chak uh, Chun Gotek House, uh, inner quarter and outer quarter, outer quarter, men's area and women's area are incorporated into one single building, uh, but still they wanted to have some separation there. So they put the little uh, lower wall fence uh, here. And in, in the case of Juil J house, uh, here in the, on the left, on the, on the right, those two um, uh, extruded parts are the outer quarter men's area and on the left uh, all over this area is the uh, inner quarter and if you see the Chung Dang house uh, you are not really actually supposed to look into the inner quarter by um, any visual contact and so to prohibit that uh, they put a, a little uh, lower wall there uh, so the, this kind of a uh, things are that we can read from the remaining uh, tangible uh, structures that uh, Confucian rituals and etiquette was uh, kind of a uh, pursuit here. And let's go back to I present, I yeah, brought a simple video that we can explore Chungyo Dang House. I uh, like the same from the podium and the foundation uh, column erects and the uh, upper structures are yeah, installed. And we can go into the house by main gate here. And you bump into men's quarter, Sarangche. 
and mostly 사랑채 is a little, uh, 안채 is higher than 사랑채 in terms of floor to floor height. This is 안채, woman's place. Um, so 안채, inner quarter, needs many, many uh, storage rooms. And those storage rooms are mostly attics. Uh, and those storage rooms are required to store many, many uh, kitchen utensils and household stuff uh, to uh, manage 제사 rituals, uh, which is in average um, 13 to 15 times a year, uh, which is a, I would say, um, a hard, uh, heavy workload. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Most of the ante uh, inner quarters have higher floor to floor height with higher ceiling, thus have um, enough um, attics for as a storage uh, room. In the meantime, houses of commoners are mostly Thatch roofed houses, and they are mostly impacted by the climate. It shows a really close relation to the climate. Uh, as you have seen in the section of the uh, topography, uh, this area is a, basically a basin. And the basin topography, uh, what you have as an atmosphere and climate is that. In summer, it is very hot, and in winter, it is very cold, and there's a big difference of temperature in a day. So what you want to do is you don't want to lose uh, temperature and keep the temperature as much as you can stable. So the plan wants to be square uh, to minimize the exposure to the outside. And in the meantime, summer, it is very hot. So you want to put the maru, uh, elevated wooden floor, which always works as a cooling place. Uh, so that's how uh, people, commoners, uh, adjusted to the climate of this area. So let's go into more about the uh, residential architecture. Um, so Yang Jin Dang House is a head family of Liu clan over 600 years and current building dates from the mid 16th century. And we'll get back to this later, but we came to know this by uh, discovering that uh, there is actually a inscribed um, documentation on top Perlin of this building. That's how we came to find out that this building is over 600 years. And that kind of documentation gives true authenticity to this building. And that's how this building has been proved as treasure. So this is at the center of Haohe village. And if you see the plan of it, it strictly faces south, even the residential parts and the shrine part over here on the north. And this view here is when you enter into the main gate, uh, you from here you see in this direction, you meet um, this outer quarter, 사랑채, and the male um, ownership will open this window from this room and will greet you. And this view is from this maru and see through this direction. And you can see the main gate that you just passed by. And Cheng Dang house is the house of Yu Song Nyung. And like I said, uh, relation with Peng Su and Confucianism at the same time, or should I say pragmatism and uh, Confucianism at the same time. So this view is from here, look to this direction. And this picture 
is in inside from Anche, inner quarter, from here to this direction. And you can see that these parts are the attics, the storages, and many of the um, household stuff and the kitchen utensils are all mostly stored here for rituals. And this is the Juilce house we, I talked about previously with a small wall here to prevent the direct visual connection to through the uh, Anche inner quarter. And this picture is the view from here to this direction showing outer quarter, men's area, Sarangche. And this picture is from here to this direction showing Anche, Antel, Anche of the uh, woman's area. Um, yeah, in the same way, you, you can see attic areas here, many storages. And Namchontet is um, the main building actually destroyed by fire in 1954. Uh, and Hadong Gotek is um, this plan. This is plan and this is three dimensional view. And you might get some confused, but this view is coming from here to this direction. So this is the main gate here, main gate here. And if you enter the building here, and then you will meet the outer quarter, men's area, Sarangche. This is the view. And the male ownership will open um, either of the window and will greet you. And this Bukchon Tech house is a little more interesting because it's constructed uh, a little bit late in the 18th century. So it shows that uh, the separation of those two gender is kind of blurring. So this part, upper part is a woman's area but here in the below on the left is for the son's area and on the right is for the father's area. And also there's another detached house, which is called the Pyeoltang. This is also for the uh, men's um, area. Uh, yeah, so you can see that the Confucianism um, rule was not really strict uh, when you, when the building was constructed a little bit late. And there are other um, important um, building types other than residential buildings, which is 정사, a study hall, and 정자, a pavilion, 서원, a Confucian academy, and 서당, a village school. Uh, and Gyeomam Jongsa <clears throat> is built in 1967. Uh, it has a refined style with engraved decoration. And from here to this direction, what you see is this view. And this is Mansong Jong, pine tree forest, which works as a windbreaker to defend from a seasonal wind. And this is Ogyeon Jongsa study hall, where Yu Song Yong actually wrote uh, Jing Birok. We'll get back to this later, but Jing Birok is the uh, documentation by Yu Song Yong. Uh, and he documented what had actually happened during the Japanese uh, invasion uh, from 1592 to 1598. And so that kind of, uh, Documentation also gives a true authenticity to this building as well. So from the left, uh, this is Jongsa, where uh, he studied. And this is next is um, Pyeoltang, where he greeted his own guests. And to the right is Anche, where uh, you can cook and prepare some food. And next is the storage rooms, Munkanche. Uh, And Binyan Jongsa study hall 
is located inside the uh, village area. And this is exactly the same size of what I have shown as a video. So you can, you guys can assume what actual um, structure is uh, there behind this um, roof and the walls. And this is Wanji Jongsa. Uh, what is a uh, characteristic about this building is that um, they have this elevated uh, pavilion here. And this is the view from this pavilion to toward this direction. So you, you can see Buyongde Cliff and the Man, and Mansongjong. And this is Byeongsan Seowon Confucian Academy. And many modern architects in Korea pick this building one of the best uh, of uh, Korean tra traditional architecture. Um, so this building is located on the sloped uh, uh, mountain of the uh, mountain Hwasan uh, facing south. And this is an open pavilion for open lecture. And these are, this is also another study hall. And these two and other buildings are to support the students who study and live here. And to the north, uh, there is shrines to pray worship uh, for a specific sages. So you can see that this building kind of attracts to the maximum of uh, the nature of the landscape to its maximum, which actually is a very popular design notion, uh, which is utilized uh, frequently in modern architecture design. So that's um, many modern architects in Korea love um, this space. And the records and documents, which actually gives a true um, authenticity to those buildings. There are so many documents and we cannot get into those each by each, but definitely this is uh, Ching Birok, first-hand experience of Japanese invasion of Korea, written by Yu Song Leung. And this was written in Ogyan Jongsa, so gives a uh, authenticity to that building. And this is uh, Yu Song Leung Chung Son Gamunjok, uh, which means that the Ryu clan uh, gathered all the documents uh, related to Yu Song Leung. And this is a list of it. And um, we cannot go through each by each. Uh, but this is a treasure. This is also treasure of, of, of um, South Korea and the treasure again. And for example, this is an award from the king to Yu Song Leung as a meritorious official who played a, a big role in fighting off the um, Japanese invasion of Korea. And this is the documentation found uh, from Yang Jin Dang house. Uh, this is on, written, this was written in inscribed uh, at the, on the center perline of uh, Yang Jin Dang house. That's how we came to know that this building was built in the 16th century. And this is how the, this documentation actually brings uh, authenticity to this building. And the people of the village, uh, the way of the life, at the time of 2009, the way of living was really remained and kept intact very well. Uh, the production life uh, really uh, kept uh, really well. And most of the uh, variety of everyday life is um, embraced at the courtyard. In Korea, we call it madang. So on the left, uh, you might want to put some jars um, to have soybeans and 
hot pepper paste because they want to be fermented. And on the right, uh, this is Yang Jindang courtyard and where traditional marriage is happening right now. And to the right, on the below, many of the uh, courtyards are actually used for production activity for you know, to uh, refine the crops. And also at the time in 2009, all the rituals and folklores really kept really tight. Uh, so this is uh, what is called Jesa. And you can see that there are many um, household uh, utensils and stuffs there, which needs to be stored at the, um, on the attic. And this kind of um, event uh, is happening around uh, 13 to 15 times a year. And I can tell you that uh, this is um, some of the, uh, pretty much of the uh, workload. Because um, um, my last name is Kwan. Kwan is also from Andong. Uh, I'm Andong Guanxi. So I know that, um, and, and my family also, my clan also really sticks to keep this uh, ritual uh, intact. And then at the same time, uh, interestingly, uh, Korean folklore beliefs remained also intact. And this is kind of also interesting that how people believe is actually dominating or dictating how people use the space. For example, you might have heard that if you pray really hard to Samshin Halmoni, then she will bring you a son that you can give birth to. And this is uh, where you pray for Samshin Halmoni, Samshin Dang. Most of the cases, uh, this is a very big tree, uh, usually Zelkova tree. And the interesting notion is that your wish is related to the middle, Jung Dang, and your wish is relate to the upper side, Sangdang. So all the spaces getting more ritual, getting more um, holy. But if you if you have a experience to travel along Europe, like it Italy, most of the villages uh, formed from this middle part where flat area and mountainous area meet. And the villages extend from middle to the top because they want to utilize the flat area for cultivation, croppings and grapes and make wines. So this kind of difference in notion kind of dictates how the people use the space and how the habitat actually settles down. And that is one of the interesting point here. And at the time, 2009, um, those are festivals like Sonyu, Birjul, Nori, and Hawe, Birshiku, Talori. All of these uh, events were really kept well. And marriage ceremony, funeral ceremony, Hwajan Nori, flower pancake play. And Hawe Maor was also very um, famous for its uh, beautiful sceneries, 16 beautiful sceneries. And this poem has been inherited orally uh, by just common people. Uh, and I brought some uh, views uh, which depicts uh, those 16 sceneries. And yeah, this is the picture of spring in Hawe village. This is summer. This is autumn and winter. Uh, and that is the end of uh, my presentation today. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for great uh, explanation for all this Hanok and many other interesting things. Yeah. So um, if anyone has 
questions, uh, you can either write down on the chat or you can actually speak up uh, for the question. <clears throat> so while we are waiting for some question, can I ask some questions? Uh, actually, yeah, it was really interesting uh, to see how this um, the uh, the building structure is built. I, I it was my first time to see that much details and the the way you show by the video. And it seems like uh, it would be really uh, hard to maintain if you don't know about this knowledge. So uh, I was curious how these um, buildings are ma maintained. Uh, so people actually live there, right? right. Yeah. yeah. And are there some specialized uh, skilled people who uh, keep inherit the knowledge? Uh, so there are some um, design firms uh, locally. Um, so yeah, they keep kind of, so they're, so the ownership of those buildings are actually quite solid clients of those firms because I see, I see. they need to be maintained and, you know, so, and also get repaired and fixed. So I yeah, see. there are some kind of uh, local um, design firms around. Uh, I see. And yep. are those um, knowledge has been well documented so that uh, people doesn't uh, don't lose uh, this um, knowledge about this structure? Yes. Um, so those uh, firms, design firms uh, document uh, on their projects and especially those treasures and important folklores and historic monuments, um, you have to have really well-documented um, set, record set. And I was one of the colleagues, the, the crew member who actually measured everything and I drew see. everything, yeah, the sections and elevations and plans. That's actually what I mostly do, did for the uh, submission of the report. So what you guys just saw, those plans and sections and three-dimensional drawings. Um, yeah, that was uh, my um, hard work. <laughs> wow, <laughs> yeah. I see. It yeah. was so impressive, yeah. Because in that way, you can inherit and you know transmit the you know, knowledge and how this was built and how this should be built and how this wants to be remained to the other people, to next generation. Yes, um, yes, that was the mission, yeah. <laughs> I see, yeah, I, I think you did a really, really important job. Okay, okay so uh, there's- I, I one... have uh, two questions. Yep. And before that, I may wanna mention that the, uh, there's a Korean crew who is now building the Korean houses in Atlanta. And they're yep. building, I think about 30 units. Yep. And yeah, and they, in using traditional deconstruction methods, not using any of the nails and and like that. I think this is from one of the, the Korean universities. In any event, uh, first question is um, the um, what is the most distinct feature of how a village that UNESCO selected as the World Heritage Site? And second question is whether there is or are similar the heritage sites in other parts of the uh, world, particularly in Asia? Um, what uh, Ecomos really embraced, embraced about how he village is that was that uh, the integrity of uh, tangible buildings uh, have um, those really well documented uh, pro, uh, documented um, materials that prove uh, what actually had happened in the past. And the secondly, what they really embrace is those a uh, way of thinking and those way of uh, life is really well kept. 
if you think about it, because I actually um, sorted out some of the uh, contents there, what kind of um, process the village went through, through the uh, modernization process of the South Korea, if you think about 90s, 50s and 60s and 70s, where we all, you know, went, went work hard to modernize South Korea. No one was like um, interested in keep the village intact and keep the way of life uh, really well uh, remained. But somehow that village, this Haohe village succeeded keep uh, keeping the traditional legacy there and also same time uh, adjusted themselves to the modernization period as well. So that was something that Ikomos really embraced about um, Havhe village. And also the same, they saw the same uh, quality in Yangdong village as well, the same quality of um, well-documented uh, uh, materials, which proves the quality of each buildings. And similar um, quality that um, the kind of a village in East Asia is, for example, Lijiang in China, uh, where in Unnam, Winnan province, that village is also um, supported by uh, fluent uh, documentation uh, and history. Um, so I can say that Lijiang, that, that's why, because Lijiang is also uh, in Korean, Yeogang, Yeogang Gosong, Lijiang is also designated as World Heritage by UNESCO. Uh, I, I'm not uh, accurate about the year, but mm. probably 2012 or 13. Yes, Lijiang is also designated as World Heritage. Thank you. There was one more question from uh, Kyunghae. So the question is, are women allowed to the shrine? Is shrine also separated by man quarter and woman quarter? Uh, I'm very um, careful <laughs> to answer this question, but um, <laughs> theoretically, um, we're not supposed, uh, if you know, <laughs> Women are not uh, supposed to be uh, close or near to um, shrines, but I'm pretty sure that even at the shrine, you do the rituals, chesa, you need to bring some, you know, uh, food and stuff. And I'm pretty sure that women is also, you know, got some access um, to those uh, shrines. I have a question. May I ask a question? Yes, please. Okay, yeah. Uh... I understand in, in Gyeongju, there's a Yangdong Mall, Yangdong village. Yes. Then Andong has Hawe village. What are the uh, major differences in those two villages? That's one question. Then how about architectural technology and art of architecture uh, and then technology wise, uh, how that the technology and artistry on building Hawe village buildings uh, was uh, spread, maybe utilized maybe for building a, like a palace for the king or any other. The technology was kind of uh, available in the whole uh, you know, Joseon dynasty in that, in that period, or just limited to uh, the Yangban, like Pungsan uh, Joshi, whatever, uh, who owned this Hawaii uh, village. Uh, question is that how the technology uh, was utilized nationwide in those periods what just was just utilized for the uh, yangban uh, class well king's class that's i'm just i'm ignorant in this area but that's just I, i'm posing this kind of question this era of elizabeth the first in european history and then also this era of uh religious war in in france and then uh saint Bartholomew's massacre area that area but in in korea it was more uh, peaceful ages, only struggling between the classes of uh, on political uh, 
you know, upheaval may be going on. And also Japan invaded uh, for Kim jin Weran and followed by Jong Weran, that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of era that we are talking about. But my question is just uh, what the architecture, technology and artistry uh, was available in the uh, country of Joseon dynasty at the time, if you know it. Um, this is uh, gonna take really long time to answer. It cover issues cover many <laughs> items, but to make uh, my answer very short, and I would say that yes, correct. The most sophisticated technique is, of course, uh, belongs to the king. You know, when you see Gyeongbokgung, uh, Changgyeonggung, or whatever. Uh, sophisticated technique, the top is always in Seoul in, in what you see when you visit Gyeongbokgung. Mm -hmm. and that's a top skill. And the thing is, um, if you wanna build that kind of really highly sophisticated building, you need money. Yes, uh, you need uh, revenue. And in the mid uh, Joseon dynasty, uh, what was uh, really interesting is that um, not many of uh, scholars actually uh, succeeded to become a bureaucrat at the central uh, Joseon dynasty. So instead, they chose to build their own village with their old own um, uh, source of um, economic income. And, the, and what you saw just so how a village is that uh, they had Pungsan uh, field, which is very big uh, cropping field for to uh, cultivate rice, rice, and from that, from there, uh, uh, young ban scholars uh, succeeded to build up a village with um, Sangmin, which is actually slaves, and then they succeeded to become very. Um, uh, economically successful. And then from that on, they kind of uh, uh, can get an access and uh, invite those top carpenters and planners from the central to Andong. Because as you have seen, it's really kind, there's really kind of barrier uh, because of uh, back to Began, the Sobek Sammek. So it's not really actually a, a easy ride. Uh, easy travel uh, from the central to the Andong, but still there's a really attractive um, money there. <laughs> so yeah, they yeah kind of uh, succeeded um, having those uh, top notch um, technique from for at the uh, 16th century. Um, that's my uh, quick answer, but how it actually happened, how they actually build up those um, Villages is a, it's a long story to tell, but uh, yeah, that's uh, my answer here for now. <laughs> Thank I, you. I'm yeah. just wondering what the, you know, the architecture technology was for uh, building uh, like Buddhist temple on the mountain. Mm -hmm. Many beautiful mountain Buddhist temple and some mm -hmm. like, uh, uh, even though there are series of war, mm -hmm. but retained some architecture like one in, I think I forgot the name of it. Uh, like uh, in Gyeongsangbukdo, there's a uh, small temple that has never been destroyed. I forgot the name of it, but mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether those technology uh, prevailed in the entire country or I just focus in uh, and utilized by the Yangban uh, family. Uh, and in Europe, there's uh, always like a, a religious building has been built uh, for mm -hmm. Catholic and then later on. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Protestant building. So public building uh, was built, was built uh, for the benefit of, uh, for, for the religious purposes. But in Korea, it was a different situation. Only thing is I can think of is like uh, Buddhism. Uh, whether Buddhist temple, do they share the similar technology or same level of technology as this uh, Andong village or like, uh, I'm just wondering, you know. 
just, you know, you don't have to answer the question, but I'm wondering, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have different societies, uh, you know, religious society in European countries, but in Korea, it was not that level, but like uh, Buddhism, right? Okay. I don't know. It also encompasses with a um, really long answer, but to you, make the answer really short. To uh, to uh, address that kind of issue, you may want to. So Korea dynasty, in Korea dynasty, before Joseon dynasty, mm -hmm. uh, Buddhism was really popular. And mm -hmm. what you might have heard, like Busoksa, uh, Muryang, Sujeon, and that, that kind of a uh, very high class, top notch, Mm -hmm. are built in Goryeo dynasty, not Joseon, because uh, mm, at see. the end of uh, Goryeo dynasty, uh, people say in, in, you know, in history book that um, people got disrupted, no, corrupted and dis, uh, disordered uh, and is very closely related to Buddhism. And that's why at the starting of Joseon dynasty, all the bureaucrats and scholars uh, stick to the Confu Confucianism yeah, exactly. and Confucianism, it also has very uh, many layers, many traits of uh, Confucianism from China. And they specifically focused on the doctrine of uh, Zhu Zi, uh, from Song Dynasty, which uh, stresses uh, ethics um, and moral morality. Mm -hmm. And it became more kind of a ruling theory of the nation itself. And then all the, those top-notch um, carpenters and planners, they cannot, all of them cannot work on the palace and some of them need to need, need work, right? And they are kind of absorbed into uh, Yangdong and Hai village because um, those work, uh, really highly sophisticated work of temples are now, the demand is really low. And that kind of shift um, happened in Joseon dynasty. Uh, and that's a quick answer here, but how actually those happened is also, yeah, case by case, uh, really a long story to tell, but yeah, that's the answer here for now. Yeah. Well, the material. Thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, for the sake of time, you have enough chances okay. after the live stream is done. So I'd like to give other people chances to pose some questions or comments at this point. Yes, uh, Rachel, you need to unmute yourself. Can you unmute, Rachel? Uh, Rachel Ward? Are you you're not unmuted still. <laughs> Ray, can you unmute Rachel? Uh, <laughs> Raquel, Raquel, I, I don't uh, think she's Rachel. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, oh, yes, yeah. Yes, oh, yes. Okay, sorry. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah, it's Raquel, not Rachel. Uh, sorry. Uh, but that uh, doesn't matter. That is not. <laughs> I have a quick question. Yep. When, when you showed the construction of the house yep. and all the pillars seem to go around the perimeter, Yep. Yet you, there is such, and I notice how all the beams, how they fit in place. Mm -hmm. So I am, I'm interested in knowing about the weight of the roof and those beams and how that weight is distributed because there did not seem to be any internal structures that supported the roof. It would seem to be only the perimeter. So if you, if you could say something about that, that would be wonderful. You picked just a very distinctive and unique character of um, construction of Hanok uh, because when you build Hanok, uh, you erect the columns and connect them with the purlins and put the upper structure. But the thing is still, the structure is not stable enough. So you wanna put all the heavy uh, weights mm. by adding sands and the roof tiles and push it really hard to the oh, below. And then everything stabilizes. And that's why when we build the roof, finish the roof, and then we go into the, to go into installing the floors. When you install the floors, 
then you stabilize the bottom part mm -hmm. of the structure. So you have the you have the stabilized part of the top and the bottom, and then you go into the middle, yeah, for the partition walls and okay. uh, yeah. So yeah. the floors act as a when you put in the floor, it acts as a brace to keep mm -hmm. the columns straight. And yes. how are the how do the columns sit on the ground? Do they go into something or do they just sit? Because is there earthquakes? Are there earthquakes in that area? <laughs> You also picked very um, important um, question there because uh, traditionally you just um, put the column on top of the foundation stone. Mm. And these days uh, there are some other connections there, but when we say like ortho in an orthodox traditional way, you just put the column on top of the foundation stone. That's why it's not really stable at all. That's why um, we put the, the ancestors yeah. put the really hard uh, uh, weight. Heavy roof. Yeah, yeah. yeah, heavy roof there, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Don't they use it, chisel away the foundation stone in the center before they put the, 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 the uh, what is it, the pillar column? Yes, um, so when I say put the column on top of the uh, foundation stone, they yeah. They, group, make they some engrave group. uh engrave the uh yeah. Engrave the profile of the, the surface of the, of the uh yeah of the uh, foundation stone and chisel it and carve it and put it um, and so on top of the uh, yeah right. foundation. Yeah. So okay. still, but still, it is not it's like not stable. Yeah, yeah, it's not really that stable at all. Uh, to but be then the floor, yeah. the floor planks presumably then further stabilize it. Sure. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, that's how um, yeah. Yeah, traditional Hanok mm -hmm. is constructed. Yeah. So, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, you can Kim. Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering. When whenever I visit Korea, um, the the beauty of the Hanok is the line, the really um, the shape roof, of the roof roof line. Roof line. Uh, are these roof lines like different from house to house, and and or are there any set rules for the to make the line, or who decides that, and and how does that come about? Mm -hmm. So that's a really um, hot issue uh, among those um, carpenters uh, in the field. And when you enter into um, building a hanok, uh, that line is kind of a pride for each carpenter's legacy line. Uh, we call the master carpenter as Gopyeonsu. And all over the Korean Peninsula, there are many who calls them themselves um, Gopyeonsu, which, which means a master carpenter. And the curve itself um, kind of differs uh, these days um, uh, according to the, those carpenter and his team or, or his legacy. Because uh, um, it's really a delicate difference, but it starts from the angled rafter, uh, chunyo, and how the uh, curve, which is called pyonggode, is um, installed. And you have to control with uh, other normal rafters and corner rafters. And how you want to control it is kind of a design issue. And Yes, so currently what I know, as far as I know, is um, that depends on what uh, class group or legacy of the uh, master carpenter uh, actually builds that part. Um, yeah, that's uh, what I know, yeah. Okay, so past 8.30, so if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and start the live stream but you are welcome to stay on and ask uh, and continue on discussions, questions. Um, so, okay. 
any other questions? Uh, first of all, let, let's. Uh, I really appreciate that the uh, Dr. Kwan was able to give us a presentation today.